Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you and with SpectraSpell. And thank you, everyone, for your patience with getting these slides started. Um, tonight, it's my pleasure to be here representing SpectraSpell and talking about the importance of micronutrient testing in methylation. It's a, um, it's a central part of my practice, and I've learned so much in treating chronic disease in this way. I have three goals tonight. The first is to introduce methylation epigenetics in a simplified way. Second is to discuss at length how micronutrients can positively and perhaps negatively influence epigenetics, and then to learn some strategies of how micronutrients can be used for optimal functioning of methylation and epigenetics. As we know, in medicine, um, we're beginning to understand that disease and health are very intimately related to these three intertwining, intertwining of factors, lifestyle choices that an individual may make, exposure to environmental toxins, and the unique individual genetics of an individual. Increasingly, we are understanding ways to promote the, a person's epigenetics and provide micronutrients that influence genetics as cofactors and promoters in order to optimize the function of a specific um, genetic enzyme. In the human genome, since it was mapped um, back in the uh, end of the, around 1990 or so, we've begun to appreciate that there are approximately 20 to 25,000 genes and that there are more than 1.4 million possible SNPs. Each of these colored ovals on this chart represent a different enzyme, and each one is needed for a unique chemical reaction to occur. Some of these enzymes function in multiple places throughout the body. We'll be talking, for example, about the Compt enzyme functioning in multiple places later on. These enzymes need cofactors to enable their enzymatic reactions to occur. Cofactors are various minerals and vitamins, and they can be supplied in our, in our diet and through nutritional supplementation. So very basically, what is methylation? Many people ask this, and it's, it's a very simply adding a methyl group and in this instance, for example, this CH3 molecule is being added to a uracil molecule, which is in DNA. When uracil picks up this CH3 molecule, it becomes a thymine molecule in DNA. This happens all over the body, constantly, morning, noon, and night, and is essential for living in so many of the processes that we're going to be reviewing in, um, in this webinar. Here, for example, is a list of the methylation functions. This is just a partial list. Methylation is needed for gene regulation. It's needed for detoxification processing in the liver, for neurotransmitter formation, very importantly for metabolizing hormones, especially estrogen hormone, we have to have COMPT enzyme um, or uh, estradiol will increase. It's needed for immune regulation, DNA and RNA synthesis, very importantly for producing energy in the mitochondria and protecting the mitochondria against reactive oxygen species and for maintaining nerve myelination. As you can see, looking at these eight functions, and there are others, methylation is needed to live. 
It's very simple. When methylation becomes impaired, that's when we begin to see impairments in our health. And if there are a great many impairments in the methylation pathway due to genetics, that's when we can begin to see more and more chronic disease developing. So we've talked about there being more than 21,000 genes, but tonight we're only going to talk about a few. These are a few of the ones I want to highlight tonight. Um, MTHFR is the most famous, of course. COMPT has many dual roles. CBS is the enzyme cystothionine beta synthetase that is the opening pathway to the sulfuration pathway. MTR and PEMT, PEMT we'll be talking about more at length, is so important for preventing dementia and um, giving membrane stability. So in this drawing, you see the methylation pathway, and it is a process, as I mentioned, it's going on all the time. When we look at this pathway, there are six simultaneous biochemical processes demonstrated here, and they interact with each other all the time. I'd like to introduce you to these and break them down so that we get a, a more of a sense of where they're occurring. The first um, cycle I want to highlight here is the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is most famously known for the production of energy. Very important for this Krebs cycle is that when heavy metals come, uh, come into our body, heavy metals can interrupt this Krebs cycle. The, the most famous of this is aluminum, but there are others such as fluoride, mercury, arsenic, antimony, that are very significant and that can shut down the Krebs cycle. And so it's important to understand how we can give cofactors to facilitate um, in improving the energy production and also how we can bypass some of these blockages. The next cycle here is the urea cycle. Urea is where ammonia is processed and is also home of the nitric oxide molecule. Very important here is ammonia. If ammonia builds up in the body, some of the symptoms of that, for example, are brain fog. To metabolize ammonia, it's, it, it's critical to keep it as low as possible because in metabolizing ammonia, you have to use up some of the um, BH4 that's needed in the neurotransmitter cycle so having a healthy urea cycle is, is critical not to develop um, untoward metabolites such as that ammonia. Now the next cycle here is that neurotransmitter cycle. As I just men mentioned, ammonia needs BH4. That BH4 is at the top of the circle and it's mandatory uh, as a cofactor for making neurotransmitters. Here you see where tryptophan can become serotonin as well as tyrosine down to dopamine. Just adjacent to this neurotransmitter cycle is the folate cycle. The folate cycle is where folic acid, common in many leafy green vegetables, is metabolized to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is possible if the MTHFR enzyme there in a beautiful robin's egg blue color is working, is present and working efficiently. If MTHFR is impaired, either heterozygous or homozygous, an individual is going to have impairment in their level of folate, methylfolate 
present intracellularly in their in the cytoplasm, which is then going to lead to further impairment um, in the processing through the methionine cycle. Next, here is the methionine cycle. The methionine cycle is the home of SAME production, S-A-M-E. It's there on the right upper quadrant of the red circle. It is the major methyl donor in the body. It, is, it is, um, has paramount importance because it does provide the methyl groups for methylation that, that then proceeds on to making DNA, RNA, proteins, and lipids. Next, we have the transsulfuration pathway. The transsulfuration pathway is where glutathione is produced and where sulfite, which is neurotoxic, is converted to sulfate by the SUOX enzyme. They're that nice pink in, um, enzyme there at the bottom. If an individual has CBS, this is where the ammonia is generated that influences over in the urea cycle. So the transsulfuration pathway is where I always like to start when I'm working with an individual um, making sure that we're opening the floodgates, so to say, downriver, so that as we activate some of these other circles and, and pathways, that metabolites do not increase um, excessively. And so I always start with the SUOX enzyme and the CBS in terms of um, trying to help an individual establish more of an equilibrium in these pathways. So here are the five cycles, and as you can see, um, they're all put together. They're all working simultaneously, continuously um, with each other. They can be friends with each other, but if these cycles are out of balance, they will cause great problems such as inflammation. And here they are each named. They function independently, and yet they flow one's products right into the other, and so they're independent, and yet, and yet they work together. Let us look more closely at what can influence the enzymes of these different pathways. We know explicitly that micronutrients can affect methylation. For example, needy cofactors have been studied and documented, and in some cases, some of these micronutrients are considered promoters as well for enzymatic activity. This is why I use the spectra cell micronutrient analysis panel in order to test for micronutrient status, because if these are low, it's going to, they, the low micronutrients will impair the enzyme functioning. If micronutrients are deficient and the enzymes aren't working sufficiently, it can lead to disease. And this is where I've seen chronic disease patterns um, having developed. The most important of the micronutrients are listed here in the methylation pathway, and they include zinc, selenium, magnesium, copper, glutathione, choline, folate, and these other B vitamins. There are other micronutrients needed, but I want to highlight these specifically. Some of the research that documents that micronutrient deficiency replacement that health can be improved was in a wonderful study that was done by Dr. Mark Houston. Um, 
in the Therapeutic Advances in Cardiovascular Disease journal where he explicitly showed that if we replace micronutrient deficiencies that individuals, many individuals, up to 62% in this hypertensive population, were able to completely taper and discontinue antihypertensive medications. That is a very significant finding and um, the, the basis of why we need to be looking at these micronutrients, for example. So here's the methylation pathway again, and the green arrows, if, if you see these, can show some of the micronutrients and where they are most effective joining in to this pathway. If, if deficient micronutrients are supplied, and these are cofactors, then the individual enzymes will start to function um, more efficiently. I'd like to point out on this slide also, if you look here in the middle of the slide where you see MTR, MTRR, there is a very dark upside down T and just above it is mercury and lead. This is an example of where heavy metals, even if you have perfect genetics, can shut down this pathway. So always I look for environmental toxins, particularly heavy metals, as you can see over in the neurotransmitter pathway to the lower left of your screen, aluminum can shut down the neurotransmitter pathway. So looking for these heavy metals and getting rid of them will help overall this methylation pathway as well. So this is a, a copy of a sample report of what you can expect in a micronutrient analysis. The center page is the overall summary of deficient test results where they list the, the actual deficiencies and then the borderline deficiencies are listed right under this. The spectrox and the immunodex indexes are given. The spectrox um, score there on the left is a measure of antioxidant capacity, and your immunodex is a measure of your immune function. To the right is a tabular presentation of all of the analytes that are tested, the, the percentage um, of numerical value of the patient's results, and then highlighted the reference ranges um, and then stated in red those particular micronutrients that are found to be deficient. To the left is a sample of what an actual report does look like and you can see there's um, the upper portion is white, then there's a yellow center portion and if a little black square is in that center yellow portion that's a borderline value and the, the lower portion in blue you would see a red dot, and we'll be seeing some of these later in our talk. Um, that's a deficient level that, that needs particular attention. So I've mentioned the word um, cofactor, and I'd like to just take a moment and just discuss this with you for just a second. Um, a cofactor is a critical needed element in order for an enzyme to function appropriately. In this particular schematic, the apoenzyme, um, which is that red um, box on the left, needs that green cofactor to make it a whole enzyme. And once that cofactor is in position with the enzyme, then the enzyme can go forward and enable the metabolic um, interaction at, at that particular point in the pathway. So a cofactor can be vitamins, they can be minerals, um, and this is how they fit in. So when we're talking about micronutrients, think cofactors. So this, the first step always is to evaluate the patient. And a good history and physical is the baseline of everything, getting a timeline 
to try to, to get a sequential history is very, very, very important. And then I always ask um, for pertinent lab tests and very commonly ask for a micronutrient analysis and methylation genetics analysis because I want to know that component of their genetics and those the deficiencies that might be inhibiting their genetics that could be causing them health problems. When I see a patient in taking the history and physical, I will very commonly see a constellation of symptoms and these symptoms could be any of those symptoms on the left, agitation, inflammation, pain, anxiety, brain fog, joint pain, etc. When I hear a, re a repetitive pattern of two or three of these symptoms, I begin to think neuroexcitotoxicity. And that is my number one goal. I want to reduce neuroexcitotoxicity. The enzymes that I've listed here on the left are the enzymes that I look at in a very special way when I hear of the symptoms um, as a whole on the, on the left. I look at these enzymes on the right and the issues of these different enzymes I've listed here. For example, the SUOX enzyme, we'll be looking at this in, in just a few moments. The SUOX enzyme, if it's not functioning, will cause an increase of sulfites, and sulfites are extremely neurotoxic. CBS, the issue with CBS is it creates a great deal of ammonia. Ammonia, as we talked about uh, a few moments ago, can cause a lot of brain fog. And, and so on. If the GAD enzymes are not working correctly, the GAD, the glutamic acid decarboxylase enzyme is not working correctly, glutamate builds up. Glutamate is extraordinarily, extraordinarily toxic and can cause um, mitochondrial uh, inflammation damage requiring um, um, more of your SOD and your glutathione enzymes to handle. We'll be going into more of this in just a few moments. So here are some of the enzymes and the cofactors that are needed to allow these enzymes um, on a reaction process to proceed normally. Certain of these micronutrients can act as promoters speeding up a reaction while some of them will act as inhibitors slowing down an enzyme. Here's a list just of some of the enzymes that, that I work with and their respective cofactors and promoters. In just a few minutes, I'll, show, I'll be showing you the pathway planner that, and how to find these as we look at some of these individual enzymes. So again, when I'm working with an individual patient, I will have their nutrient analysis out on my desk in front of me, and I will be looking at their symptom complex, their problems that, that have been triggered off in my evaluation, and the pertinent enzymes that could be responsible for this. And then I will look at the individual enzymes one by one, and the cofactors to see how we can make recommendations to correct some of these underlying problems. In the office, when I look at a patient's genetic report, then at the micronutrient report, I'm looking for deficiencies. Here is an example on the left of the MTHFR genetics test by SpectraCell. Looking closely at this in the center, you should be able to see that this report shows a, a, a patient sample who is heterozygous for both of the analytes of MTHFR. 
there are two different analysts that are tested, the MTHFR C677 as well as MTHFR A1298C. We'll be looking at these more in depth. If there is a low intracellular folate level, this could be a reflection of impaired MTHFR genetic functioning. It could also implicate a low cofactor for the MTHFR gene to be functioning, which is vitamin B2, riboflavin. So this is a tool. It's called the Pathway Planner. I use it in my practice in, to evaluate genetics um, reports as well as cofactors needed when looking at the micronutrient report. Let's get closer to this. The first pathway we're going to look at is the transsulfuration pathway. The first enzyme that I look at is the SUOX enzyme. It metabolizes sulfites and the, um, the cofactor, the major cofactor is molybdenum, hydroxy B12 and vitamin E are promoters. For CBS, CBS, as we mentioned earlier, can increase ammonia, which is the vitamin B6 is the cofactor for CBS. Carnitine will, will neutralize ammonia when it's present. So, for example, if I have an individual with a CBS problem, I will look on the micronutrient analysis for carnitine and will encourage an individual to take um, carnitine with meals high in animal protein. Here is where the SUOX enzyme is located. In the center of the red circle, the SUOX is in oval. And as you can see, molybdenum and vitamin B1 are needed cofactors for SUOX to be working efficiently. Here is the CBS enzyme, <clears throat> vitamin B6, and carnitine are very helpful. B6 is the cofactor for CBS. Carnitine will neutralize ammonia that is overly generated by the CBS enzyme defect. Let us talk about the methionine cycle next. The two enzymes here that are prominent are BHMT, the short route through the methionine cycle, and MTR. BHMT is in the center of the red circle. And as you can see, the, uh, the zinc molecule is coming in. We need zinc as a cofactor for BHMT. And from the lower right-hand corner, you can see choline coming up. Phosphatidylcholine is very helpful for enhancing the activity of BHMT and is considered a promoter. Here on the micronutrient analysis is where I look for choline when I am looking at the BHMT um, function. I, I like to see the choline uh, as it's demonstrated here in the um, um, upper half of this graph as a plentiful state. This is particularly important because choline is essential for two reasons. We'll be talking about this. Acetylcholine production, which is the neurotransmitter for memory, and for appropriate lipid composition of cellular membranes.
MTR is where is the major enzyme of where the folate cycle meets the methionine cycle. And it's right here in the center of the red box. The needed precursors, um, cofactors needed for MTR to function appropriately are methylfolate, 5-methylfolate, and methyl B12. Insufficiencies of either of these will impair the speed of the MTR enzyme. As you can see, zinc is also needed here as a cofactor. So zinc is a cofactor. The 5-methylfolate and the methylcopolamine are uh, promoters here. Here is the um, folate cycle, and it's where we find the MTHFR enzyme. Vitamin B3 in, and, and vitamin B2, riboflavin and niacin, are critical for this pathway. Let us look more closely at the MTHFR enzyme. When testing for MTHFR genotype, we look at two different genotypes. One is the C677 analyte, and the second is A1298C. I want to show you where they are most active and their importance. Here is where the MTHFR genotype 1298C is located and is important in the neurotransmitter cycle. The, in the methionine cycle is where we see the MTHFR C677 being active. On an, on an individual report, an individual may be normal in A1298C, for example, but they may be heterozygous or homozygous for the MTHFR C677, or vice versa. You may see, see either of these. Because this MTHFR is, has two different functions, the physical and the metabolic consequences can also be different with these two different genetic impairments. There are two main antioxidant enzymes that deserve very special attention. They are produced in the methylation pathway, and I want to talk about both of these for just a moment because they influence the mitochondria. They are called SOD, or superoxide dismutase, and GST, or glutathione S-transferase. SOD specifically needs manganese, zinc, and copper, whereas GST needs selenium, cysteine, glutamate, glycine, which goes on to become serine, and magnesium. Of special note, the SOD enzymes are, are not one, but there are three different SOD enzymes in, in the body that we know of. The first one is in the cytoplasm, and it is um, associated with, possibly, amylotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, being formed, and it has been implicated in the formation of Alzheimer's. It is particularly important that there be sufficient copper and zinc, as you can see in the center of this schematic, uh, the blue copper molecule and the orangish-red 
zinc molecule are needed for these for this particular enzyme to be made. If a person is low in copper and zinc, SOD1 is going to be impaired, and that becomes a, um, a big problem with handling reactive oxygen species within the cytoplasm. Here is the molecular structure of the second SOD enzyme, which requires manganese. SOD2 requiring manganese is considered to be the main SOD in the mitochondria. I've listed here some of the um, potential linkages of what a deficiency in SOD2 is linked with, including premature aging, motor neuron disease, possibly cancer, idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Just from these few potential consequences, um, we can understand how important it is to have adequate manganese in our, in our diet, in our body, in order to make this enzyme efficiently. So here we are back on the pathway planner, and right in the center of this red box is where you see SOD being formed. And the cofactors needed, copper, zinc, and manganese are listed here. So if we don't have that, this enzyme is impaired, and then reactive oxygen species throughout the body and in the mitochondria, particularly in the cytoplasm, are, are going to suffer. And will the, when that occurs, there's a greater likelihood then of disease developing. On the micronutrient panel, this is where we find the results for manganese, zinc, copper, magnesium, and calcium. If any of these levels are low, it's very concerning to me because enzyme formation is going to be impaired due to the lack of these these precursor materials. But not only will enzyme formation be impaired, many of these minerals are cofactors that require other reactions in the body. If they're deficient, there's going to be problems. So I'm, I always pay special attention to this. Next, I'd like to, like to talk about glutathione. Glutathione is the major antioxidant of the body, as considered by a lot of scientists. And if there is low intracellular glutathione, it is particularly worrisome. Glutathione is formed right here in this red box on the, and as you can see at the very bottom of the red box, where um, glutathione production is formed, we need three major uh, promoters, ingredients, to make glutathione in our body, serine, glutamine, and cysteine. Closely looking at this pathway planner, you can see serine and cysteine there at the top of the red, inside the red box, and a little bit further down where Gamma glutamyl cysteine is, is made, so that's where the glutamine is going to be coming in. Very specifically, I, I want to show you in liver detoxification, under the required nutrients on the left, the third analyte down, the, the, the third required nutrient down is glutathione. Glutathione is needed in order for the liver to pick up toxins and process the toxins in this phase one of the liver onto phase two and then out through the urine and, and stool. 
if we don't have sufficient glutathione, uh, a lack of glutathione is going to impair detoxification here in the liver. This demonstrates where we look for cysteine on the uh, micronutrient report. And here are serine and glutamine. So if, so if any of these are low, those are specific micronutrients we can uh, suggest to the patient for increasing to help with glutathione production. The next enzyme I would like to discuss is the PEMT enzyme. PEMT stands for phosphatidylethanolamine methyl transferase. It's perhaps one of the most important enzymes of the body is that it is needed for making phosphatidylcholine. If phosphatidylcholine is impaired, then the making of choline, which goes on to make acetylcholine, is going to be impaired. This is the neurotransmitter for memory. As you can see, if we, if we need phosphatidylcholine in our body but unable to make it, this is, this is another micronutrient that can be recommended and supplied to bypass a genetic defect. In addition, the same PEMT enzyme making phosphatidylcholine is essential for the integrity of cell membrane structure and permeability, for the signaling between cell membrane structure, structures, transportation of fats, lipid digestion, and amino acid synthesis. If we don't have enough phosphatidylcholine, the ramifications are liver disease, obesity, insulin resistant, atherosclerosis. Let me show you, um, this is a review of the, I'm going to go down one slide, I got this slide mixed up, my apology, I want to go down one slide. This is why phosphatidylcholine is needed. It is um, needed for all of the orange in this um, lipid bilayer of a macrophage. This is representative of the lipid bilayer of our cells. Look at all that orange. All of that orange is phosphatidylcholine. If we have a PEMT enzyme defect, we don't make enough choline to supply the needs of the cells of our body and that's where we begin to see increased inflammation, increased pain and the development of a more chronic disease process. So a summary, phosphatidylcholine is needed for acetylcholine. In addition, the corollary is the need for acetyl L carnitine for the other half of acetylcholine. In making acetylcholine, you need the choline part from the phosphatidylcholine, and you need the acetyl group from the acetyl L carnitine. When I look at a micronutrient panel result, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the level of their choline intracellularly and of their carnitine. If these are deficient, those are direct things that, that we can suggest replacement for. Here is the next enzyme I wanted to discuss briefly. It's the Compt enzyme. It is required for the metabolism, as you can see here, of dopamine. 
and epinephrine. It's in three different areas here in the neurotransmitter pathway. The COMPT enzyme needs magnesium, copper, vitamin B1, which is thiamine, SAMe, and vitamin B12. It's, it's important for this epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine breakdown, but there is a second very, very, very important function of COMPT that I would like to touch on. And that is that COMPT is required for estrogen metabolism in two very important pathways of the metabolism of estradiol. Here in the center of the gold circles, you can see where the COMPT enzyme is needed. If a patient is impaired in those, then a patient will be at a much, much higher risk for estrogen-related breast cancers. For example, when I have a patient with COMPT enzymes like this, I encourage them never to take estradiol because of their increased risk for estrogen-related breast cancers. So tonight, what we've tested...